you would, take your Bibles this morning and turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. I ended last week's message, and I did not have a clue where I was going to go. And uh, I told somebody this week, I wish in a way sometimes it was that we got divine inspiration, but it just don't work that way. <laughs> You just kind of sit there and you, you, con- I, and the good thing is I, I, I graciously get the opportunity to read so much material on a daily basis and usually something that I read will kind of key my mind and I got, yeah, we, we preached through many chapters in John. I know we did like an eight or nine part series on John chapter 17 and we're not going to go all the way to 17, but I thought, you know, I, I got, got, got the story hung up in my mind about Christ washing the disciples' feet. That's where I started at all. I was going to preach on uh, this work of our being clean, and we'll get there next week. But I got hung up in verse 1. <laughs> and so I've entitled this message, Having Loved His Own. I could not get, couldn't get by that, Having Loved His Own. <laughs> And I hope and I pray that the Lord will bless this to our minds this morning and to our hearts and he'll give us comfort and encouragement from his word because that's what it's all about. You know, I don't ever seek to uh, make anybody feel uncomfortable. I, I, yeah, I stand up here and every time I stand in the pulpit, I always have said this and I will say it as long as I've got breath. I, I always have Isaiah 40 verses 1 and 2 in my mind. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith the Lord. Speak comfortably unto her. Tell her that she's received twofold. She's received the double portion. And that's what I want to tell sinners. I'm not going to put you on a path to getting right so you won't get left. I'm going to point you to Christ. I hope I do. I, 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 I swear I so desperately want to every time I stand up here. And I know these men who fill in for me, I want them to do the same. And when you represent this this body of believers in this work of the ministry that we have been given together which is grace baptist church i hope you do the same it's not follow me it's follow him it's follow christ and so as i got to looking at this i i I did a lot of reading i tell i don't think i've ever consumed as much material to cover one verse that i that i that i read this week on on these chapters john 13 because they're they're, you know really in reality this is a new section It's a new section of Scripture. This gospel begins with this final part. This is our Lord's words to his apostles, which Judas is carried, is here through part of the time. And I I found some interesting things, and I'm not going to go run down that road, but there's some interesting things that you get from harmonizing all the gospels and what's going on and the time status of this situation. But one of the things that we have to do before we can really look at John 13 through verse chapter 16, we're not going into 17 and covering it again, but we need to consider the context. I've told you this, context is everything. It always is. No matter what part of God's word, whether it's an isolated verse or whether it's a chapter, or even an epistle, the context is so vital to our understanding of, the, of the, what, what's being said, who's saying it, what's the intention behind it. So we have to keep in context Christ's actions and his words in these chapters to those who he graciously calls his own. Notice what it says, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, And this is not in my notes, but I'll give you this. Do you see the distinction that's made here? How world can't mean everybody? Because he's loved his own, which where were they at? They were in the world, right? He loved them unto the end. So here's the context. Our Lord Jesus Christ had spent three and a half years in his public ministry in the presence of of those the scriptures call his own. Primarily the Jews. And he performed miracles, did he not? And declared the truth that confirmed him to be the Messiah, the one sin of God. But here's the thing. 
He came unto his own, John says. There's that same phrase that's in our text. He came unto his own, and his own, what they do? They embraced him, did they not? No, his own received him not. Think about what our Lord Jesus Christ had done in the presence of these natural born Jews. The first miracle that he performed was what? He turned water into wine. What else did our Lord Jesus Christ do? In their presence, he fed the 5,000. Later, he fed the 4,000. He restored, did something somebody nobody had ever done before. He cured somebody who had been blind from their birth. Gave them sight. He made the lame to walk. He took the man that was halt, withered. Remember him at the pool of Bethesda? Made him walk, made him stretch forth his hand. He had set free those that were demoniacs, right? He'd raised the dead, including Lazarus, who if you go back and you read chapter 12, <coughs> now, when they're gathered here, they, they come there, they want to see Lazarus because Lazarus has been raised from the dead. But chapter 12 tells us something else. The Jews, all the religious Jews, they wanted Lazarus dead because Lazarus kind of went against their case. (laughs) Done all these things, and yet for the most part, what were these Jews? They were unmoved, and they were unbelieving. Listen to you. This is chapter 12. Now is my soul trouble. He was talking with his apostles. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. There's that hour. The hour, you think about this now. Our text starts off, it says that he knew his hour was come. Here it says, our Lord said, Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came a voice from heaven. That's something else that occurred. There's a voice from heaven confirmed him twice. Voice from heaven came saying, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The people, therefore, these Jews who stood by, heard it. They said what? It thundered. Others said what? An angel spoke to him. Jesus answered said, this voice came not because of me, but what? It came for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And here's what I've come to do. And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all to me. How they respond to that? The people answered, We have heard out of the law. I'd like for them to find me that part of the law. We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. That's true. But here's what they miss. How shall, how do you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? And then here's here's the the kicker. Who is this Son of Man? (laughs) He stands in their presence. Folks, this shows the reality of the spiritual darkness and depravity of all men and women by nature. Truly, Jeremiah got it right. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can understand it? It amazes me. The Lord of glory had walked in the presence of these Jews for three and a half years. And they couldn't see him. And they couldn't believe him. You got to remember what Christ told Nicodemus. One who was like them. He told Nicodemus twice, except a man be born again, what? He cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And he repeated it. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Sadly, after this encounter with these Jews, that our Lord spent all his time with them, he brings to a close his earthly ministry. Listen to you. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while, and it was just a little while, is the light with you. Who's the light? Christ. Walk while you have the light. 
lest darkness come upon you, for he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While you have light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of light. Saddest, something to it. This is one of the saddest sentences in the Word of God. These things spake Jesus and departed. Listen to us. Lord, don't ever let this be my lot. He hid himself. He hid himself from them. And visionary. Three and a half years teaching, instructing, speaking words that tell them who he is and what he had come to do. They reject the Lord of glory, and what does our Lord do? He hides himself from them. This word translated did hide himself. You know what it means? It means simply what it states. It means to conceal. Here's the same word. You know, our Lord had spoken some harsh words to the Jews in John chapter 8. He had told them, poor Abraham was, I am. And they picked up stones to kill him. Jesus hid himself. How effective is this hiding at our Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, here's a group of Jews pick up rocks to kill our Lord. He hid himself. He's in their midst. And he went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, passed right by them. He was cloaked. <laughs> the cloak of invisibility. They couldn't see him. And I tell you what, you think about it. By the way this religious world judges success, they would look at this, these first 12 chapters of our Lord Jesus Christ and they'd say, they'd have to confess, he, he was a failure by what he had accomplished. Because here he is, he's done all that he can do, and now these same people, he's done all these miracles and all these works and spoke all these words, what do they do? They reject the Lord of glory. Won't accept him. But I tell you what, all this happened on purpose, did it not? It all of it happened according to the sovereign will and purpose of our God. What do we know of our Lord Jesus Christ? All that the Father giveth me, what do they do? They come to me, and him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. I cannot state this boldly enough or dogmatically enough or scripturally enough or enough times. Not one more nor one less than those given to Christ by God the Father in everlasting covenant of grace will come to him. Not one more, not one less. You say, well, that's just discouraged. I, tell you, I am thankful to my God that God gave a people to Christ. Because if God hadn't given Christ to people, you know who would have came? No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. You keep that in. That's the context. <laughs> oh, Lord. Yeah, that's the context, sure enough. But here in John chapter 13 through chapter 17, Christ, you know what he does? He speaks words of comfort and encouragement. That's what our Lord always had. Words of comfort, words of encouragement. But he doesn't speak it to the world. He's hid himself from the world. He's hid himself from those who are called his own. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. And who's he got with him? Twelve little Omega men. His twelve apostles that he had called. One of them being a devil. We'll get to that next week. Okay. I'm not going to try to cover that one this week. That's why I'm saying we're sticking to verse 1 because there's so much to, to unfold out of this, these, these chapters and these stories that are recorded. Our Lord speaks words of comfort and encouragement not to the world but to who? His own chosen apostles. Those who he's about to unleash on the world. <laughs> they don't look like they're unleashed, but folks, he's fixing to unleash them on this world. I know when he, when he unleashed them, those Jews said, the whole world's gone after them. Huh? But here's the thing. Even though it's just the apostles, and this is what we've got to do when we study the scriptures that were present, that heard these words. These words that our Lord speaks in their hearing, what are they? They are the prized possession. Of each and every one of God's elect in every generation. Every one of us who believe and rest in Christ is the Lord our righteousness through these men's words. 
Think about it. The same thing we're preaching today is the same words that Paul preached and John recorded in our text. So the narrative begins with what I think has to be the most comforting word and comforting truth to those who are sinners. God's eternal love to his own. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come that he should depart out of this world under the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. When our text states now before the feast of the Passover, which that feast of the Passover, what was it? It's a picture or type of the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God sent into the world to take away the sin of the world. So before this feast of the Passover, I'd have you to notice something about our Lord Jesus Christ's thoughts here. His thoughts aren't about himself. They're not about the agony and suffering that he's about to endure, the humiliation that's about to come into his life. His thoughts are about who? Read these four chapters. He's consumed with the objects of his love. Go read the Song of Solomon again. Uh-huh. That brings to my mind the words of, of David in Psalm 14, 40, verse 17. Listen to it. I am poor and needy. Yet the Lord does what? He thinketh on me. <laughs> preached on this in Jeremiah chapter 29 states this for I know the thoughts that I think toward you you know what that word thoughts that I think on you you know what that means the purpose thoughts that I think on you is literally purpose or plan I know the plan or purpose that, that toward you saith the Lord that he thinks he thinks so so thoughts there's the same word thoughts of peace not evil. Thank God to give you an expected end. And what I find so interesting is the word translated thinketh in Psalm 40 and translated that I think in Jeremiah 29. In the original, it's the same word David used in Psalm 32, verse 2. What's that? Bless the man to whom the Lord imputeth. There's the same word, folks imputeth not iniquity and in whose spirit is no God. In each instance that this word used, whether it's translated thought to think upon or impute, it means the same exact thing, David. You know what it means? It means to account. It means to credit to or to charge to or the best is this. It means to impute. Now consider Christ's thoughts toward his people. I know the thoughts that I think toward you. What? Thoughts of imputation. Imputation of what? Of my righteousness. Of my accomplished work. Of what I was sent by the Father to do in this present world. But you notice how the Apostle John framed Christ's thoughts in this moment. When Christ knew, listen, when he knew that his hour was come that he should depart out of the world. That word translated new here, it means to perceive with the senses. To perceive with the senses. If you look back, look back up in chapter 12. Look at verse 27. John chapter 12, verse 27. Christ told his apostles, Now is my soul trouble. And what shall I say, Father? Save me from this, there's a, this hour. Save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Word translated hour in both these verses means the same thing. It means any definite time, a point of time, or for a moment. <laughs> Several times in John's gospel, you know, men got angry at our Lord Jesus Christ and they sought to take him, sought to lay hands on him. And in two instances, in John chapter 7, verse 30, and John chapter 8, verse 20, John wrote this, No man laid hands on him because his hour was not come. Yet in our text, it states Christ uh, perceived with his senses, he knew, 
He perceived with his senses that the definite point of time or moment for his departure out of this world under the Father had arrived. And the language that he uses here, depart out of the world under the Father, it signified Christ's knowledge, his understanding of his impending death on the behalf of his people. The Apostle Paul used similar language over in Philippians chapter 1 when he said this, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart. What do you mean by that? To die, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Having a desire to depart and beware. You believe that? Huh? You, do you truly believe if you have rested in Christ this morning as the Lord your righteousness, if you have a desire to depart, where will you be? I you, if you believe this gospel, when I preach your funeral, if they, somebody preaches mine, make that point clear. And don't sit there and talk about if anybody deserves. <laughs> they, they, I'm not. So, I mean, we're going to talk about, listen, we, we, have a, we, did, we have a desire to depart. I love it here. Yeah, I love my wife, my children, my granddaughter. I, I, I'm so filled with joy over everything that the Lord has done for me. Aren't you? But folks, this place ain't my home. No, it's not. Every, I told somebody this week, everything related to this earth, whether it's my wife or my children or my home or my finances or my health, it's all related to what? This world. And it's going to pay. All, all flesh is this grass. And it's every, every I'm going to fail you. You believe that? I hope I didn't knock that out. <laughs> I hit it with my hand. I did that before. I'm, I'm going to let you down. I hope I don't, but I will. And I guarantee you, you will let me down. Why? We're humans. We're creatures of flesh and blood, folks. We fail ourselves and we fail others, but Christ knew this was the appointed time, the appointed hour that he had came into this world. How do I know that? When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. That's the hour he came for. Right there. And see, the thing is, faced with such an awesome task, Christ's thoughts, as he approached that hour, are recorded for us. What's his thoughts? In that hour, knew the hour's coming, depart out of this world and go into the Father. What was his thoughts? Having loved his own, <laughs> he loved them unto the end. I'm going to tell you what, the unregenerate, natural mind, though it might be religious and moral and sincere and dedicated, they are absolutely ignorant of the scriptural realities of God's love. You hear me? Most, if not all, that I have encountered in this present evil world, they think of God's love in a similar fashion to their own love. Meaning what? Meaning it is reactionary. Here's how, here's how most folks, your friends, my friends, your family, my family, people you work with, Deal with on a daily basis. This is how they view God's law. I don't even care if they're reformed. Most, they, they all think the same thing. But they, they think this. Because God loved all men without exception and wanted all men to be saved. I, that, that's what their God's like. He, want, he, he loves everybody and he wants everybody to be saved. I've had 2 Peter chapter 3, 9 pushed at me all my life as a gospel believer. What does that one say? God's not willing that any should perish, but it all should come, repent, come to repentance, right? That's another message there, too. But it ain't talking about all men and women without exception. They think that God sent Christ into this world to show his love. How did he show his love? By suffering and bleeding and dying for all men in hope in hope, a wish that somebody would come to him. I don't know any other way to state this. Their God and their Christ wants to and can't, trying to and he won't save anybody because they believe God will not and he cannot 
will not and he cannot violate man's free will. Is that what Christ meant when it says having loved his own, he loved them unto the end? And he's offering love to everybody and he's trying to do a work to save somebody and he wants you to respond, he wants you to accept him as your personal Lord and Savior? I think, you remember the fact that Christ departed out of this world is proof positive what? He accomplished the work. If he's still in the tomb over in Israel, we need a Savior. His departing proves that it was finished. So exactly what did our Lord Jesus Christ mean, or the apostle mean, when he recorded these words, having loved his own, he loved him to the end. Three things real quick. And I promise I'll be quick. <laughs> it's got 15 minutes. Okay, here we go. Having loved his own, he loved them to the end. What does he mean by that? Three things. First of all, you know what he means? He teaches us who God loves. People say, oh, God, don't go down this road. I'm going down the scripture road. He teaches us who Christ loved. Who did he love? Having loved his own. He loved them, his own, unto the end. Think back to John chapter 1, verse 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Now put the two together, and if you don't understand the scriptures, you've got a contradiction going on. Now you do. In the verse, that verse in John chapter 1, verse 11, he came unto his own, his own received him. Now who's his own referred to? His countrymen. Natural Jews. Abraham's sons and daughters by natural birth. What did our Lord do? Our Lord came to them. He performed miracles in their presence. He performed signs and wonders. Spoke the truth that confirmed him to be the very Christ, the one for whom they were instructed to look for. Yet what did they do? They didn't receive him. They missed him. They, folk, the Jews are still looking for Messiah. Do you realize that? Those people over there that have been through so much. Don't get me wrong. They have been through a lot. But they're still looking for Messiah. He's come. He lived. He died. He rose again. He's gone to glory, taking his place as King of kings and Lord of lords. And they're still looking for him to come. Missed him completely. Now, I'll tell you this much. Christ didn't love them. And he certainly didn't love them to the end. And this is so important. It didn't have anything to do with what they did or what they didn't do. You hear that? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. What's to do the will of the Father which is in heaven? Believe on him whom God hath sent. That's the will of the Father. It is not keeping the Ten Commandments. Many will say to me day in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out demons and in thy name done many wonderful works? Then will I profess in them, I never knew you. I never loved you. That's what the word means. Look it up for yourself. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. So if his own's not talking about the Jews and it's not talking about all men and women without exception, who's it talking about when he says, having loved his own, he loved them to the end? Well, it's speaking about the 11 apostles. The, you hear that? The 11 apostles. Excluding who? Judas is carrying. But seeing all God's elect in every generation are going to believe on him through the words of these 11 men. Because listen, the gospel got here, it came here from these 11 men and who else? Huh? The apostle Paul. Their word. His own refers to every vessel of mercy that was prepared before unto glory. That's what he's talking about. Christ says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and known a man as the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for who? The sheep. Not the goat, the sheep. No other sheep I have which are not of this fold. They're not a national Israel. And they're not people that are these 11 apostles plus the apostle Paul. What are they? They're Gentiles. They're not of this fold of national Israel. Them also I must bring. And what are we going to do? We're going to have a Jewish race and a Gentile race. No, there's going to be one fold. 
And there's going to be how many shepherds? Just one. That's all. So his own speaks all those chosen by God the Father in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and given by God the Father to Christ the Son in the everlasting covenant of grace. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus according as he hath chosen us in him. Chosen who? Us, his own, in him when he chooses before the foundation of the world. Here's the second thing we learn from these words. Christ's love for his own, you know what it is? It's eternal. Having loved. See that? Having loved his own. How long did he love them? Until the end. Until the end. Christ's love to his people is not conditioned on the sinner loving him. Let me repeat that. Christ's love for his own people is not conditioned on his people starting to love him. When did Christ first love you? Huh? When did it happen? We love him because. What did he do? He first loved us. That's what tells me if Christ loved his own, what's going to happen? If it's everybody... Having loved his own, he loved them to the end. And he tells us, we love him. All, we love him. Who, who loves him? Because he first loved us. So if he loves every man and woman without exception, who's going to love him? You see that? <laughs> That's just ridiculous. No, it's not. It's, just, it's rational and it's reasonable and it's scriptural. And if you'll notice in this text... It's Christ loved us when? In the past. So Christ loved his own when? Before they ever loved him. The scripture says of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if Christ is God, and like the Father, he's eternal and unchangeable, and it says here that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, if he loves me now, there, listen, there has never been a time that God has not loved me. Ooh. <laughs> the Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, since I've loved you with an everlasting love, I have drawn you with, with loving kindness have I drawn you. Christ tells us the same thing. Listen to it. I and them, this is his high priestly prayer. I and them and thou and me that they may be perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as you've loved me. So he relates God's love to his own is the same love that God has to who? Oh, but our Lord doesn't stop. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me for thou love. Remember, love them as you love me. That's what he wants us to know. For thou lovest me, the Son, when? From before the foundation of the world. Is that clear enough? God doesn't start loving a sinner when they accept him as their personal Lord and Savior. That's not even scriptural. You can't find that kind of terminology in this book. Christ is not up for your acceptance or your rejection. He is not an offer to you. Not the general offer of the gospel. I'm declaring to you the fact that Christ redeemed his people from their sins. He loved us and knew us from all eternity. And therefore, what does he do? The last thing, he loved us how long? Until the end. Christ's love, here's the last point. His love to his own is manifest in the accomplishment of redemption of all those whom he loved. Having loved his own, he loved them to the end. 
And I, this is the one part I really want to get to. <laughs> I'm trying to get here this whole message. Like I've told you in the past, words mean everything, don't they? Especially when it comes to a proper understanding of the scripture. And here's the words. Having loved his own, he loved them too. Here's two little words. The end. That's a one little Greek word. And it's a Greek word, and it, it, to me it's just a powerful word, and I don't say it because I'm trying to make you think I'm a Greek scholar. It's a Greek word, teleos. And it literally means termination. It means the limit at which a thing ceases to be always of the end. It's always used of the end of some act or state. You say, well, what would you tell us that for? Well, in our text, where we just read, having loved his own, he loved them unto the end, the word translated the end is an adverb. So it modifies what? The subject of the sentence. I've been having to learn English all over again. <laughs> it modifies the subject. But here's the same word used as a verb. Christ said it is finished and he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost here's the same word used by the apostle Paul Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every man that believes you say what are you talking about preacher what do you mean by saying this well here's what I mean when it says that he loved his own to the end folk Christ's love was active and he died for his own, securing their eternal redemption. You don't know the definition of love? Here's the definition of love. Here ends love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son. And it, they added in a little word that this world goes because they added in two little words. He sent his son to be the press, not there. He sent his son to the propitiation for our sins. Who? His own. His own. In other words, Christ's love for his own folks is proven by the fact that he did everything required as our surety to save us from our sin. He loved, having loved us, right? Having loved his own, he loved them to the end, to the fulfillment, to the termination point of what? Righteousness established by his doing and his dying. And he did it all in such a way that he satisfied every single solitary part of God's law and justice in a way that enables God to be both a just God and a Savior. Now, we'll come back next week and we'll pick up verse 2. And we're going to cover verses 2 through 11 next week, okay, because it's one story and we can get that done. But I wanted to introduce this subject to you. This morning. Let's stand together and we'll be dismissed. David, would you dismiss us, please? Father, we do thank you so much for the great redemption.